Hello, welcome uh, to today's local government education program uh, provided by the University of Illinois Extension and the Institute of Government Public Affairs, IGPA, University of Illinois System Center. My name is Joseph Malowal, and I am the Community and Economic Development Specialist for the University of Illinois Extension. Uh, before introducing our topic and presenters, I wanted to uh, point out a few things. Uh, at any time, uh, participants uh, can write questions into the chat box, including if you have any problem connecting. Uh, we will monitor the chat and address question or relay them to our speakers at the end of the presentations. Uh, please notice that participants will receive uh, presentation materials, including the recording for this webinar. Today, topic for uh, topic for today webinar is fiscal and economics impacts of the COVID nineteen pandemic in Illinois. Uh, we have four presenters today. Our first presenter is David Merriman. David is the Stuckel Presidential Professor, Department of Public Administration, and a senior scholar, University of Illinois at Chicago, and the Institute of Government uh, Public Affairs. University of Illinois. He co-founded and directs the, Illinois, uh, the University of Illinois Physical Futures Projects, which mentors the physical condition of the state of Illinois. Uh, Professor Merriam, Merriman has served as the State of Illinois Council of Economic Advisors under, three, under the three last gov uh, Illinois governors, and has been an advisor to uh, Cook County and the city of Chicago. He has conducted many academic studies on state and local public finance. Our second presenter today is uh, Kenneth Chris, University Distinguished Professor of Public Administration at the University of Illinois at Springfield. Dr. Chris' research focuses on subnational uh, debt policy and administration, public pension and funds management, government financial risk management, economic and revenue forecasting and behavioral public finance. Dr. Chris has consulted with several public nonprofit organization on financial and economic matters across the country. Our third presenter is Dr. Geoffrey Owings, Director Emeritus of Regional Economic Application Laboratory at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, as well as Emeritus Professor in the Department of Economics Agricultural and Consumer Economics, Urban and Regional Planning, and the Institute of Government Public Affairs. Professor Owings, uh, main, uh, main research areas are in the field of urban and regional analysis. Our fourth presenter is Anna Kuss. Anna is the Associate Director of, of the Government Finance Center, Research Center. He designs, conducts, and manages Research, research within the center, uh, center's priority areas. Amanda worked with faculty and external advisory panels to advance the center goals and disseminate its research. Her research focus include state and local finance, housing, and physical analysis. Please welcome our presenters, and um, each of them will take about 10 minutes to present and then we will open up for Q&A. At this time, I'm going to hand it over to uh, David. Hi, thanks very much, Joseph, for that introduction. And uh, I'm glad to be here. And I want to first uh, thank the Illinois Extension for setting this up and all of you for coming. And uh, also say on behalf of the Institute of Government and Public Affairs, uh, which we call IGPA, uh, that we're happy to be here and present this research, and we're also happy to uh, help you. Uh, our goal, uh, our mission is to present evidence-based research and public engagement. And uh, we're happy to work particularly with public officials or people interested in working with public officials uh, to make better policy. Um, and uh, on that vein, uh, this group, uh, has published a couple of papers out of IGPA, and you can see it on the IGPA website. Um, you can't quite see the website on this slide, but it, you will be able to download the slides. It has the exact um, URL. Um, 
we published a couple of papers summarizing some thoughts on uh, these fiscal and economic effects. Um, and as you might imagine, this is a very, very rapidly changing area. So we published the first paper back in early April and a second paper uh, on fiscal effects primarily and a second paper in May. And really here today, we're gonna update that information a little bit, but that information I think is still generally valid. It uh, gives you good background, but we're gonna update some of that information here today. So I wanna talk um, first uh, just in general about historical trends kind of going into, sorry, going into uh, this pandemic. So this slide um, shows data from a data set that uh, the Fiscal, Future Pro Fiscal Futures Project has been assembling over the past uh, 15 or 20 years, it's about 20 years of data. And Joseph mentioned what we do in that project is we kind of monitor the fiscal condition of the state of Illinois. This is specifically the state government budget. And uh, we do that in a way that's a little different than much of what you read in the media. We construct this thing, which we call the all funds budget. And the all funds budget goes beyond the general funds. So those of you who are familiar with government budgeting know there's typically a general fund and then other funds outside of that. In the state of Illinois case, about half of the money the state spends is in the general funds. And you often see that discussed in the media. Uh, but there are many other funds, so for instance, a large portion of Medicaid that's not in the general funds, most transportation funds. And so we've assembled the data in uh, consistent ways over a long period of time to look at that. And what you can see on this uh, slide is probably not surprising to most of you. If you go back to about the 19, late 1990s, 1998 or so, the state funds were just about in balance, spending just about was balanced with revenue. But over time, spending has grown faster than revenue. And as a result, we've had uh, several, uh, we've, we have significant deficits in the state. And um, the, uh, in recent years, we've had uh, uh, large and growing deficits. We were starting to get back on the right track before COVID-19 but uh, we are now, uh, if, if, if this goes up only to uh, the end of the last fiscal year, 2019 fiscal year. Um, you can look specifically at, at the revenues. I wanted to unpack the revenues a little bit. So this shows the sales tax and the income tax revenues, which are by far the largest revenues in uh, uh, tax revenues that the states get. And what you see is that there's been slow growth in the red line, the, uh, the the uh, uh, the lines, I'm afraid, are mislabeled. The, 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 yeah, the slow growth in the sales tax, uh, the, which is the red line, and uh, more um, up and down growth in income tax. And that's, of course, because we've had changes in the ta income tax rates. But um, even with those increases in income tax rates, uh, we have obviously not had sufficient funds to pay for our spending. What happened with COVID-19? So this is the latest information we have. This is complete information for fiscal year 2020. Um, and it's just the general fund because we haven't yet had a chance to assemble all of the revenues in the state from the all funds budget. But what it shows is um, a really significant decline uh, overall in, in revenues, uh, for state taxes, it's down almost 5%. And remember, fiscal 2020 ended um, on July 1st. So this, uh, the, the, the uh, effect of COVID was just really on the March, April, May, and June revenues. And um, revenues are down about 5%. Uh, um, what we've done, is short-term borrowing. And this is just for 2020, we've borrowed $1.2 billion to try and fill in some of the whole of what was lost. And again, that's just for the general fund. Um, in 2021, 
the fiscal 21, which started on July 1st, um, you know, we've got 12 months to get through if it, as it looks like now COVID-19 is gonna be a continuing problem, we're gonna really face very significant problems. You can all look, also look at the expenditure side and we just have um, historical data on expenditures. And there's really three things that drive the expenditures of the state. These are um, about more than a half of the, the state's expenditures. It's Medicaid, it's K-12 education, it's pensions. As you can guess, none of those are going to be easy to cut. Pensions for legal reasons, K-12 education because there's a consistent demand from both parties to spend more on K-12 education and we've been trying to do that. And then Medicaid, of course, because we have a large vulnerable population and they're made more vulnerable by the K through by the COVID-19 pandemic. So the bottom line is that Illinois entered the pandemic in a very troubled fiscal situation. State revenues fell substantially in uh, state fiscal year 2020, uh, but probably more difficulty is coming. Tax revenues that are most affected are the income and sales tax revenues, and those are the largest sources of tax revenue in the state. And it won't be very easy to cut spending because spending items are very difficult to cut, the ones that are large. So I'll turn it over to my colleagues, and I hope that they will be able to cheer you up at least a little. <laughs> so I'll stop sharing my screen, and I think Ken is going to talk next. I will indeed. And uh, the task of, of cheering you up might be a little difficult, um, but given what I'm going to present, but, but we'll try. There's, there's maybe a little hope out there. So um, David talked a lot about kind of setting the stage for, for where the state was. And uh, next I'm going to talk about where we are currently and where we might be going. So in terms of the economy, um, we've, we've had a project at, at UIS to track what are called uh, uh, nowcasts of national gross domestic products. So uh, this is the figure you see cited in the paper. Um, and uh, you see for quarter one, uh, the average nowcast that we had, we had developed a basically just a simple average model was about 3.8%. It, it, the actual economic growth came in at just under 5%. I think it's been revised uh, to just right at 5%, or a negative 5% for first quarter. Now you see, the, you see the estimates for second quarter, the kind of the consensus estimate seems to be right around 30 to 35% decline year over year. And let me explain that again. Uh, sometimes because of the way it's presented, uh, things get kind of lost. What that figure is, it's a seasonally adjusted, it's, uh, but it's an annualized rate. So what this says is, if economic growth were to persist over the next four quarters, the way it's done in the last quarter, uh, GDP would be 30% lower than what it is now, 30 to 35%. So it's an annualized rate. So it doesn't mean the economy went down by 30% in, in one quarter. It, meant, it means if we had that same pace over time, you'd see a 30% fall. So it's, it's still been a, a, a big drop, but I, I don't want people to focus too much on the number of 30% or 35% because uh, it, it isn't a, an, an actual decline of that much. We're now starting to get now cast for the third quarter. The New York Fed uh, has started to release it. It looks like uh, there'll be a recovery uh, on the order of 10 to 15 percent. Um, I, I believe they, the, uh, the St. Louis Fed is going to come out with an economic news index, which in the next couple of weeks, which will show about a 10 to 15 percent increase for the third quarter. And again, that doesn't mean it's going to be up 10%. It means it's going to be, if, if we continued like the next four quarters, it would be up 10%. So bottom line, big drop in quarter two and, and a somewhat of a recovery in quarter three. Um, 
We also have at UIS, we've, we've uh, entered into an agreement with a credit card aggregator to track consumer spending data through credit card receipts, a company called Earnest Research. They have a, a panel of 6 million households that are in their program. And so they track the uh, credit card spending of those 6 million households. So obviously you have a very large representative sample. Um, and you see aggregate consumer spending. And, and the nice thing about this data is it's, it comes every week. So um, as of the end of June in Illinois, consumer spending was still about 6.2% below where it was last year. Uh, for the rest of the country, it was minus 0.2. They actually, as we're speaking right now, they're, they're issuing their new data. And so I'll be able to update this, but I think uh, looking at some early trends, that's probably going back down at the national level because of what's happening in places like California, Arizona, Florida, and, and places like that. So do, where do we go from here? That's the, that's the real question. That's probably why you signed on. And unfortunately, I don't have a firm answer for you. Um, I can tell you the different types of things that people are looking at. This is from Standard & Poor's Global Economics. Um, uh, they're, they're one of the kind of major forecasting companies. I, I, I watch the forecasts from places like uh, S&P and Moody's and, and Fitch a lot closer than I do some of the other ones because they, they have more of a vested interest in being right. Um, I know it's not anything scientific, but, but they're, the entire business model of the ratings companies are based upon getting it right. So. Um, Earlier this year, they, they came out with a report that looked at three possible scenarios. Uh, scenario A would be what is sometimes called a V-shaped recovery. Um, and that's probably off the table. They only give about a 10% probability that we'll have that. And, and looking at the early quarter three data, it's probably not going to have this shape. Um, that would have had uh, GDP coming back to its original level around the end of 2021. Uh, scenarios B and C uh, bring us back close in, in the case of scenario B by the end of 2022. Um, and this is what we might call a U-shaped recovery. Um, uh, and that, uh, our S&P said, uh, ascribes about a 50% to 60% likelihood of this, this U-shaped recovery. Uh, and then in the in the, the shapes category, the scenario C is what has been described by other people as a Nike swoosh recovery. Um, and, and Moody's assigns about a, or Moody's, I'm sorry, S&P assigns about a 30% probability we'll have this. In this case, we won't be anywhere near um, where we were uh, even by the end of 2022. Uh, just this, uh, this morning, I got another forecast from uh, another group, the Economist Intelligence Unit, um, and they predicted that by quarter three, 2020, we would be close to the, to the baseline, which is more like a B-shaped uh, B, B or U-shaped recovery, uh, scenario B here. And one of the things that's that I want to impress upon people is just the tremendous range of uncertainty in the forecast. Uh, the Philadelphia Federal Reserve Bank every quarter carries out what's called the, the survey of professional forecasters. They, they survey around 50 of what they consider to be the top uh, business forecasters in the nation. Some are academics, a lot work for banks or, or the Moody's and Standard & Poor's guys are in this also. And this is the range of 2020 economic growth estimates. So um, the, the, the one you're probably uh, looking at, uh, if you want to know the, the, the median estimate is about uh, minus 5.6%, which would be someplace in here. That's the median estimate. But as you can see, you have this whole range of estimates that, that lie below that. And then you also have some that are that are above that. And so, uh, so there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, uh, I wish I could offer something more than uh, it's uh, th than that. Um, but 
there, there's, there's no way now to, to, to know with any type of certainty what's going on because a lot of factors, and I can discuss those in further comments if, if people are interested. Uh, one last thing, and, and David kind of set this up. Sorry. Got to get rid of this uh, annotation. There we go. Uh, so uh, this is uh, from the paper we put out in April. This is our early estimate of what, the, what will happen to state revenues. And this is for the big three revenues that David was talking about. Uh, the, the individual income tax, the corporate income tax, and the sales tax. Um, what we were looking at is different scenarios and the, the Moody's B scenario is roughly somewhere between the R moderate severity five and moderate severity six or severe, sorry, severe pandemic six uh, uh, estimates. So somewhere in this middle ground here. Um, which would be a, a revenue loss of about $10 billion between calendar years 20 and 21. Now this differs from the fiscal year. David talked about a, a $2 billion loss in revenues in, in, in fiscal year 2020. Uh, but as he said, that only consisted of uh, three months uh, during the pandemic. Um, and so uh, cal over the next two calendar years, it'll be about 10 billion. And then if you want to compare it to the baseline further out for 2022 and 2023, you're talking about total revenue losses that, that need to be recouped by the state in, on the order of magnitude of about $20 billion over the four year period. And so each year we're in this recession, the state is going to continue to bleed red ink. And so it's going to be more and more difficult for local governments to to adjust to that and, and have any type of certainty about what they're gonna get for revenues. That's one of the things we're, we're very concerned with and, and uh, along with my, uh, some of researchers at UIS, we're starting to look at that right now. So with that, I will, uh, I didn't make anybody happy, uh, but I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff to uh, inflict more pain. Thank you, Ken. Well, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to, uh, to present a, a few remarks. And what I'm going to focus on is the impacts on the economies of Illinois. I'll start off with a summary of our impact on the state as a whole. And then I want to start a discussion about what we're likely to see happening on the various constituent economies without uh, trying to provide the sort of forecast that, that Ken has done in great detail, but a sort of general sense about where things are going. And the first comment to make, of course, is that uh, Illinois is a, an incredibly diverse economy. And when we look below the level of the state, we find that the heterogeneity in terms of impacts and in terms of forecasts is likely to be increasing uh, over the next several quarters. And uh, what I would like to invite you to do is to get onto our website uh, every month and look at the updates that you, you will find here. And it's under something called the Illinois Economic Observatory. So let's first of all, start off with the uh, summary of the forecasted impact on the total Illinois economy. And what we did, we, we assumed uh, following colleagues at the uh, Chicago Federal Reserve Bank that a sort of a, a median estimate of the likely job losses in the economy would be somewhere around 15 million jobs. Now, you may say, but already we've seen many, many more of these jobs lost. But these are uh, job losses that we're trying to look at over the course of a year, that year being April of this year to April of next year. And so some of the job losses that we've seen in the last several months are likely only to be short-lived, maybe two, three, or four months. And so if we aggregate all these partial job losses, in total, we're probably looking at a total loss of around 15 million for the US economy as a whole. And uh, the Illinois economy is somewhere around three and a half to 4% of the US economy. And we look very similar to the US economy in terms of our structure. So we made an assumption 
that if we take about 4% of that, that's likely to, to generate a total impact of around 500,000 uh, job losses over the course of this year. Those job losses are gonna be very, very heavily concentrated in a small number of sectors. In particular, the whole bunch of sectors we refer to as services uh, with subsidiary uh, concentrations in trade, particularly retail trade and in transportation uh, communications. Um, and those three sectors are ones where we're going to see the bulk of the job losses taking place. And part of the reason why uh, state revenues are going to be down is if you look at this number here, this is our anticipated loss of income in the Illinois economy. That's $28 um, billion of income that would be lost. And of course, if people are not earning income, uh, they're not paying income taxes, they're not spending money, so they're not contributing uh, state taxes. Businesses likewise are not gonna be contributing. And the loss of production in, in the economy uh, we're thinking is somewhere around $76 billion over the course of the year. Now the question is, what is that gonna look like as we look uh, uh, th throughout the state? And this is the data for May. And the question is, why are we still looking at May? And the problem is the data for other than the state of Illinois comes out two to three weeks after state level data. So next week we will have the June data and we can at least uh, give you uh, an update. But you can see uh, what, it, what is, uh, has been happening. In the last 12 months, uh, we've seen a, a loss for the uh, Illinois economy very heavily concentrated in, in April, May and June of, of somewhere around seven or 800,000 uh, jobs, uh, representing uh, a loss of about 12% uh, percent in those job rates. And you can see there are some beginnings of uh, different uh, impacts. When you look at the metro economies, it's very, very similar because about 80% of our uh, population is in metro areas to the statewide effects. The rural areas, in other words, the non-metro, it's even higher. It's very, very close to 15% of their, uh, their total economy. Uh, Chicago upstate is very uh, close to the, uh, the statewide average and non-Chicago is a little bit, bit higher. So basically uh, what we've, we've seen here is that while we look at what happened in, in, in May in the beginning part of June, that we see this uptick in, in job creation, um, we still have not recovered more than 10% of the job losses that occurred uh, earlier in the first and second quarter. And one of the reasons why Chicago's employment losses are so much higher than the rest of the state is that 20% of Chicago's employment is concentrated in what are called vulnerable sectors, uh, particularly trade, uh, retail trade and transportation. We have uh, O'Hare and as we know, the airlines have suffered very dramatic job losses, professional business services, and very importantly, in leisure and hospitality, uh, very large hotel concentrations in the Chicago region. Many of them now uh, shuttered or only opening partially. When we look um, uh, more extensively at uh, the impacts at the county level, uh, th these are data for, for May 2020. Uh, just look at the colors, don't try to look at the numbers. The light and uh, slightly darker blues indicate job losses or unemployment rates that are below the Illinois average. And Illinois had a seasonally adjusted unemployment rate of 15%, about two percentage points higher than the US. Um, the light rate, light red, um, about the Illinois average. So these are counties that are behaving about uh, the same as the state as a whole. And the darker red, uh, these are the uh, counties that are uh, experiencing losses in terms of higher unemployment rates than the state as a whole. And one of the things you can see is that uh, the central part of the state seems to uh, be much uh, less affected, still very, very dramatically uh, elevated unemployment rates, and the northern and southern parts of the state uh, seem to have uh, much, much higher rates. And so what we would do then is to get inside this and try to understand what is happening. 
But let me just summarize it for, for the metro area uh, at, at this point. What we ha do every month is we have a metro business index and essentially is an index of leading economic indicators. And we do a number of things for each of these in turn, but I just wanted to show you one summary graph. And this is how the MSAs, the metropolitan statistical areas, compare with Chicago. And you can see there's a zero line here, and this indicates performance that is about the same as Chicago. If you're above this, you're doing better than Chicago. If you're below it, you're doing worse than Chicago. And what we've seen over time is some dramatic shifts in the relationship of downstate to Chicago. Um, from 2007 until 2009, so during the two years prior to our entering uh, the previous recession, all of the metro areas performed better than Chicago. But from 2009 until the first quarter of this year, the metro areas performed generally less well than Chicago. So um, that is sort of interesting, a, a change in the, in the spatial dynamics of what's happening within the state. And as we make our forecast uh, from April onwards, what we're uh, estimating is that all of the other SMSAs are likely to perform better over this period than Chicago. And part of this reason goes back to the uh, composition of uh, Chicago's employment and the fact that it is much more dominated by those vulnerable sectors than the other SMSAs. So when I say it's gonna be performing better, it doesn't mean we're gonna see dramatic increases, but it just means that recovery downstate is likely, according to our forecast, to probably occur at somewhat more elevated rates than uh, for Chicago and the state as a whole. And uh, a summary of um, uh, the sort of recovery profiles is shown here. Uh, in the first row, you've got positive recovery, but the one year ahead forecast is still way below the 2020 peak. So included in that would be Chicago, Champaign, Urbana, Rantoul, and the Quad Cities. And the second row, uh, more uncertain uh, recovery with Decatur and Peoria to predominantly manufacturing uh, metropolitan areas uh, expected to do less well and recover less rapidly than the other SMSAs. And for Springfield, um, the recovery is much more uncertain. And this probably relates uh, very much to the uh, impacts on employment in, in, in state and local government. So with that, I'm going to allow Amanda to uh, uh, make her remarks. Thank you. All right, great. Um, let me share my screen. All right, great. Um, so I'm uh, kind of batting up and have more, I guess, doom and gloom uh, to bring. <laughs> and um, so I've, I'm going to focus on kind of how this economic and, and fiscal impacts are going to uh, impact the public pension systems um, and uh, touch on a little bit what insights we have from the last financial crisis, the 2008 recession, to think about kind of what's coming in terms of public pension systems. So one thing I think is, is important to recognize is that the impact of the economic downturn, the recession on public pension systems, their funding levels, and in turn, uh, government's required contributions is gonna lag the recession. In other words, the kind of impact, even if we had a V recovery, the impact of the financial downturn on public pension systems is gonna linger longer. And so I think there's kind of three key issues I see. One is that uh, we already know and state and local governments are already experiencing these budget deficits tied to the revenue shortfalls and increased spending. Um, so this is gonna make it challenging absent any change in the pension funding levels. This makes it challenging for state and local governments to make the required pension payments. 
Um, and local governments are especially hard hit from declines in their own source revenue, as well as the decline in Illinois' state revenue, um, which is shared with local governments. Because again, we saw some slides about the downturn, the decline in the income and sales tax revenue. That's gonna also hit local governments' budgets. Uh, the second is that there's gonna be increased uh, required pension contributions due to uh, what I expect is gonna be a decrease in those funding levels um, tied to investment losses. So this is gonna, any kind of drop in the pension system's funding levels is gonna in turn increase required contributions because government contributions in Illinois have to be sufficient so that the pension systems reach specific targeted funding levels. Uh, for the state pension systems, it's 90% by 2045. For the non-Chicago police and fire pension systems, it's 90% by 2040, right? So any kind of decrease in the funding levels just means government contributions go that much higher, in turn exacerbating these bu budget deficits. Um, the last Point, I think it to think about is the risk of some pension systems running out of assets. Um, and in such a scenario, uh, benefits that are paid out to retirees and beneficiaries could be halted or governments would have to be paying sufficient amounts of money to keep those benefits going. Um, and though the contributions that a government would have to pay to just pay the benefits out directly would be even more expensive than the contributions required to get to that 90% uh, funding, funding target. Um, in other words, if a pension system runs out of assets, everything's gonna be kind of that much worse. So then looking at the kind of last recession, I think provides some insight into what happened with pension fund funding levels. And we can kind of think about then what might happen going forward in the wake of COVID-19. Um, so this chart is showing the funded ratio, which is the ratio of assets to liability for the state pension systems, Illinois state pension systems, which is in blue, and then the non-Chicago police and fire pension systems, which is in black. Um, so, while unfunded pension liabilities have long been an issue, especially in Illinois, it became a real policy focus in the wake of the last recession. And that was in part because of the decrease in pension funding levels and declines in revenues, which made it that much more challenging for governments to make the required contributions. So here in Illinois, right, the state pension systems going into the last recession, the 2008 recession, weren't fully funded. And the state pension systems, so that blue line, they dropped from a, a high of si being 63% funded in 2007 down to 39% funded by 2013. So this was kind of their low point. And then, and that's a, a big drop uh, over a short period of time. And since 2013, the, the funding level for the state pension systems has really just hovered around 40%. Um, with the public safety systems, they went from 62% funded in 2005 uh, and are about 55% funded today in aggregate. Um, so not as precipitous as a drop as the state pension systems, but a, a decrease. And I think you know, one takeaway from this also is that while the recession, the financial crisis ended, we didn't see an immediate kind of bounce back in pension systems funding levels. Again, this is gonna be a long-term problem. Um, and then I've been focusing more on the non-Chicago police and fire pension systems because there's over 600 of them in Illinois. And just looking at the aggregate funding level masks of what is a really wide range in funding levels. So there's some police and fire pension systems that are less than 10% funded in Illinois, and there's others that are over 100% funded. Um, and so I wanted to kind of dig into them a bit more and understand this variation in funding levels for the police and fire pension systems because this is a fiscal 
pressure for local governments throughout the state. So I, I took the 600 police and fire pension systems and divided them into three groups based on their 2008, 2018 funding levels um, to better understand this variation as well as changes in their funding levels over time. So this chart is showing the average funded ratio for these three different groups. So the group that is represented by the red bar, these are the one third of the pension systems that are the least funded. The black bar represents the pension systems, the one, the one third that have the highest funded uh, ratios. And then we have the middle group that is in gray. So one thing to note is that while the funded ratio, the funding levels for the systems all decreased between 2007 and 2012, after 2012, we see the funding level for kind of the best, the most well-funded pension systems increases to 74%. When we look at this bottom group, right, we see this continuing trend of a decline in the funding level. So the average funded ratio for our least funded systems went from 54% in 2007 down to 38% by 2018. Um, so what I think are some key takeaways of this is one, that overall, most of these pension systems were going into this financial crisis less funded than they were prior to the last financial crisis. Uh, and two, we see this growing divergence in, in funding levels between uh, well and severely underfunded pension systems in the public safety funds. And, and this kind of divergence between well-funded systems and underfunded systems mirrors what is kind of a national trend. Um, so there's uh, some research reports that show that kind of similarly at the national level, there are uh, places like Wisconsin that have well-funded pension systems and those places, they saw their funding levels decrease in the wake of the last recession, but then they kind of recovered. And then there's places like Illinois, uh, which have seen their funding levels kind of continue to erode over time. So using 2018 data, I also created some metrics to look at the liquidity of these public safety systems. Because I was trying to figure out what's the risk of any of these pension systems running out of assets, which is, I think, a worst case scenario. And how widespread is this risk? Um, so I guess the kind of good news uh, is that it, it wasn't widespread. Uh, in other words, it wasn't the case that the majority of the 600 police and fire pension systems look like they're going to run out of assets. Um, but there is a, a small number, about 6% of that group, that have a combination of um, negative liquidity factors and really low funded ratios. And those are the pool, that's the kind of pool of the pension systems that I'm um, kind of most concerned about that are going to run out of assets. And then the question is going to become, I think, you know, what happens to the beneficiaries that are reliant on their pension benefits, as well as what are the kind of legal uh, ramifications? What happens if a pension system uh, runs out of assets in Illinois? Um, and so while David said that maybe we would uh, provide you with more uplifting comments, I think I'm ending on an extremely doom and gloom scenario, uh, but I will turn it over to Joseph now um, so we can move to the Q&A portion. All right, great. Thank you uh, to our presenters for uh, their time and expertise. We're going to proceed now to the Q&A. And I'm going to read uh, some of the questions that are uh, posted on the chat. Uh, also, my colleague, uh, Nancy Wadrago is in there. Nancy, jump in at a time. I think there are some that I may need your help. Um, the first question was, um, I think it was, must have been David's slide. It was on the slide that, is, that was de uh, depicting the percentage decline in tax revenue for 2020 physical year. Mm -hmm. um, Nancy, you wanna to add to that? That's something about 
remark about 5% a year, even though for the first few months? Yes, in regards to the slide, um, talking about the, the percent of um, change in, yep, that's the slide right there. Robin asks, 5% uh, for a year, yes, but is that uh, even though that we had a hit just for a few months within just the tail end of that um, fiscal year 2020 as the pandemic took effect and the impacts of the pandemic took effect on, on that. So she's wanting to just ask the question of perhaps why that's not a more dire number. Um, so if, if somebody wants to explain why the numbers yeah, look that way. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it is, uh, you know, uh, it is just uh, for, it, that's 5% annually. And the the the, the FY uh, twenty versus FY nineteen is is uh, five percent below. Of, of course, in the absence of the pandemic, revenues would have been greater. So that if you you think about the fall from what you would have expected, it's probably it's certainly more than five percent. Um, one one thing to note here, though, is that the um, the change in the due date for the income taxes um, means that the uh, it's actually a little uh, this five percent number actually overstates the pessimism a little bit because uh, we will get a little chunk of revenue in July as people um, are paying their income taxes late. So some of the people who uh, have not filed yet for FY 2020, for, I'm sorry, for calendar year 2020 income taxes, but had to file by today. Um, so we're expecting to get a little bit of revenue um, as a result of that. So uh, I, I'm not sure if that qu quite answers your question. We're down, uh, if you look just at the, what was actually collected as of the end of June of 2020, it's about 5% revenue, 5% less tax revenue than we had in 2019. Okay. And again, uh, feel free to uh, ask questions, uh, post them on the chat. Uh, the other question uh, was, uh, why did excise tax revenue, such as gambling, went down so significantly? Almost the, the, greater than the, the reason is that the casinos were closed by the stay-at-home order. That's the that's the most significant thing. The casinos, there was no uh, uh, there was no horse racing, um, and, and uh, the slot machines. Many of the slot machines and uh, where the state gets revenue from, all of those things. That that was a, a, a huge hit. So they literally those revenues went down to zero in most uh, around the state for several months. Okay. So another question is um, um, wondering if we are able to obtain credit card spending data narrowed down to the county or the city level through the University of Illinois. Uh, there, it, David, I, I think that's mine. I, yeah, you can answer that, Ken. Yeah. All right, so um, let me, uh, can you uh, stop your sharing, David? Yeah. Sorry. Yep, there we go. Um, so just to show you here, and, and actually, um, this is the feed I, I get from, from Earnest Research. Uh, the answer to your question is partially yes and partially no. The geographies offered are um, national, regional, which is dividing them by census region, statewide, uh, something called CBSA, which is a core-based statistical area, so it includes your metropolitan statistical areas and your micropolitan statistical areas, and then by city. Uh, Ernest does not do it specifically by the county. They might be able to produce a special aggregation. Uh, this you're looking at right now is for Springfield, the city of Springfield uh, itself. Um, so you can see the pattern here. Uh, April 1st was the real low point in spending. Um, now, the one thing about this is that I should say is 
this is all categories, what they call channels. So this includes both in-store and, um, and online. Um, so let me just see if sometimes this, this is a really like data intensive application. So it might take a second to update, but you're going to see what is one of the real challenges for the recovery right now. This is, this is in-store spending right now. It just updated. Um, so in-store spending for the city, uh, reached a, uh, uh, what's the op a nadir, an absolute opposite of Zenith, whatever the bottom is, the trough of 46.5% year over year decline as of a week of a ending April 1st. It's now down only 10.6% only year over year. Um, so the answer is yes, we can get it by lots of different things. I also know of another source if you wanted specifically counter, county level data. The problem is I don't have an agreement with them. And so I, I'm not sure, I, I, I know Earnest Research and I know their, uh, I know their work. And so um, I will uh, I will reach out to them. And uh, Daniel just push uh, post another question. I assumed it was about that about the website links. The problem is that's that's I, I have an agreement with them to go log on to their so I can send you their website, but you'd have to enter into an agreement with them in order to uh, in order to to get it. I'm not sure who they're allowing to do that. All right. Okay, we still have time for questions. If there's any question that uh, the presenters can address or any comment. I'll, I'll put a question to my colleague. All right. <laughs> I, I wonder if um, you all could talk to or kind of think about the relationship of the kind of economic downturn and state and local kind of budgets. Because it, it seems to me that um, state and local governments are really in a bind. They don't have enough revenue. There, there doesn't seem to be kind of sufficient federal support coming. And so I, I kind of wonder of if we don't Kind of improve the finances of state and local governments does that trigger another recession what happens to kind of employment of the of public sector uh employees in those dynamics i i i um, i can sit, talk a little bit there has already been uh i don't have the numbers in front of me but already significant loss of employment in state and local sector and um that is a uh you know, that, that is a significant drag on the economy. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it's going to pretty hit some groups particularly hard. Those generally aren't high income areas. Um, so it, it's, it's difficult to envision what will happen if there is not a federal bailout. Uh, quite frankly, it's, I, I heard uh, the, Con the Illinois Comptroller talking yesterday, and she talked about, uh, you know, the, the state strategy is basically to borrow, they've borrowed some money already from the Fed. They're going to probably borrow more from the Federal Reserve System. Uh, it's very difficult to see how we pay that back without uh, without a significant federal government uh, bailout. I yeah, know. I yeah. If I can piggyback that on a little bit, I, uh, Pew Research just came out with a report that looked at um, you know what I think everybody thinks is the, the, the first thing that is gonna go are gonna be sales tax revenues um, with income tax, you know, especially if, if uh, stimulus plans aren't renewed or are gonna be next. Um, and then the one that I'm privately a little bit worried about is what happens to, to real estate and, and property taxes in the long run. Amanda, maybe you can answer this, but but I, I know somebody who just came from California and what he says is property, especially rents in the cities are plummeting. Yeah. yeah. And and what that means is property values are going to go down. So you could be, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I've got my screen still shared. I apologize. I didn't, oh, I didn't. Mm -mm. You're good. I think you're good. Am I sharing my screen? No. 
No. Oh, no. Uh, that's screen. I don't know what screen is that. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, um, so so that's my honest concern is is what happens if we get property tax um, uh, problems and and what does that mean for for you know local governments? Uh, I, I I hate to offer this example because I don't want people to 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 focus on this too much. But if if you remember during the Great Depression when we were all alive. <laughs> um, there, you know, part, there were a lot of, there were a lot of government defaults. That was the, that was the main period of government bankruptcies. Mm -hmm. And it came because the price of real estate cratered. Um, and in the last recession, um, quite a few districts, special improvement districts that were around development actually went bankrupt. And so it's, it's uh, you know, it's it's one of the things that, that that does keep me up at night a little bit is wondering about that kind of second order effects. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, this is anecdotally, and for those in the audience that don't know, I uh, while I work for UIC, I physically live in California in um, Silicon Valley, right near Facebook's headquarters, and kind of anecdotally, I've been following uh, Zillow quite closely, looking at rent prices and kind of availability. And what it looks like to me is that uh, demand for rents just has withered away and we've seen uh, increase, a, a drop in kind of rental prices. So it's suddenly, you know, where before it was, landlords had many people kind of competing to rent their unit. Now it looks like the reverse and it looks like a kind of renter's market and that uh, renters can kind of command more power in that relationship. Um, I haven't seen it with the home sales quite as much. So it, it seemed like there was a pause on that uh, in the kind of initial month and there has been some pent up demand for that. So at least the kind of buying and selling of single family properties, I, prices are still high for that. Um, but I, I very much also share your concern about what is gonna happen with, with the real estate market and I, I'm kind of mentally assuming that there's going to be some decline. Let, let, yeah. let me add, Joseph, let me add. can I can I add to that? Uh, we we uh, do the forecast. This is Jeff Hughes um, for uh, uh, the state, Chicago, and then every quarter for the uh, metro areas. And what we've seen uh, to follow on Amanda's comments uh, has been a very dramatic uh, year-over-year drop in sales. But uh, for the last uh, several months, the decline in prices has been very sticky. And uh, there are two things that we are, we are looking at right now that may change that dynamic. And that is, we've seen an increase in the state in the number of requests for forbearance. In other words, to um, delay paying uh, a mortgage. Secondly, uh, national data just released indicates a 6% increase in delinquencies. In other words, people who's, uh, who have delayed uh, a mortgage payment. But even more pressing is starting in the first part of 2017, we've seen the foreclosure inventory starting to rise again, having declined from about 2012 uh, to 2017, it started to increase. And the last six months, net additions to that foreclosure have uh, been much, much uh, greater than we've seen uh, for the last several years. So I think there are some dynamics here, going back to your comment, Amanda, uh, and, the, and yours, Ken, about um, uh, real estate revenues uh, that are likely to, um, to be really serious and something that really needs to be monitored. Because if prices start to decline, then valuations are going to have to be remade, which is going to reduce the take. Lost you. Yep. Okay, I think also we are. <laughs> give a loss. And if I could okay. just follow on that, I, I just sorry to just say one more thing is, um, I I also authored a paper and we looked at what tends to happen as you get, uh, as Jeff said, the 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 delinquencies rise, is those people are not also typically paying property taxes, and so your property tax collection rates fall. So at the same time you have your properties going down in value, you have your collection rates falling, which is like a double whammy. And so, yeah. I think 
Yeah. Tying it to the local governments, this creates a real problem because most of the local governments in Illinois have been reliant on the property taxes to make the pension payments to the police and fire pension systems. As um, some of your colleagues at UIS have, have done some great work looking at that kind of stress on local governments and uh, some alternative strategies that local governments have been employing. But yeah, it's, the, these things seem kind of interrelated and uh, all bad. All right. Thank you very much. It's, I think we, are, uh, we have one minute and uh, we have some question up there. We don't have time. Uh, sorry, but we're going to provide you with the, the contact of the presenters uh, if you want to follow up uh, with those questions. Uh, at this time, I, I think we, we wanted to see if anybody wants to stay past the one o'clock hour, we can continue a Q&A if that's OK. All right. OK. Yeah. As well or. Yep, I am. Yep, and I see uh, people are dropping. Also, if you want to uh, participate in the in the poll, Nancy, you want to I'll do that? Yeah, thank. You. Yeah, and please respond to the polls, and uh, that is very useful for us. Uh, please continue with any question and answer items. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to say one more thing about on the real estate uh, part, which is um, that, you know, that I think a lot of the talk uh, is or the focus is on the residential real estate market. You should also think about the non residential real estate market, particularly with respect to retail uh, things and that's particularly a concern in Cook County where we have a, a assessment system that values those properties at um, higher than the residential properties two and a half times as high um, and I'm very concerned about that loss of revenue also from those non-residential uh, and particularly stores yeah the um, uh, to follow up on that the census actually has a new uh, product the small business pulse survey um, and I haven't looked at the, the most recent data, but the, the, the data uh, from the last week that I, I'm aware of, which ended at the end of June, um, showed that a significant amount of businesses had lost or it had missed, uh, missed payments. Um, I guess it's down. It was, at one point, it was above 20 to 25% of uh, small businesses had, had missed either a rent utilities or, or had missed payroll. Um, now it's down to about 13% in the most recent week. But, um, you know, as, as David said, there's, I think there's gonna be a lot of renegotiation of, of leases, um, you know, forbearance, unofficial forbearance offered. Um, and so I think it's, it's one of those coping strategies which we're all gonna have to, to watch. That in there, additional, let's see. I don't know, this question was uh, addressed, but uh, question about, do you feel there is significant departure of Illinois residents, business, businesses, and if so, what, what sort of impact do you feel that it will have on the economy? Well, the We've, we've, we're in a state for the last 15 years that has experienced net out, net out migration. And the question is, where are people going to go to? And during a period where the economy was growing and the grass always looked greener somewhere else, um, it probably is not going to be, I think, seriously elevated for two reasons. One is uh, there's not a lot of economic activity growing in other parts of the country. And secondly, a lot of people who are invested in uh, real estate are not going to see this as a really good time probably to try to, uh, to sell the house and move somewhere else. So I, I think we will probably see uh, migration somewhat muted 
over the next several months until we get more clearer and more consistent signals about what, what's going on in the economy. And I think that uh, um, when I, I, I talk to colleagues in other states, I think that's the general consensus that I think people are just going to, uh, for the most part, stay put. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I, I, this is Ken. I, I agree with that. I, I the the one the one thing I would say is for, and, and this gets back to a, a, a property market type of question is you know people who do have the ability or, or need to make a choice may increasingly choose to live outside of urban areas. That might be something that occurs, but that's that'll be a much more long run type of a type of effect if we get. We, I noticed one of the questions asked about other pandemics. If, if, if goodness forbid, we get something else that comes along, um, you know, urban areas might be increasingly unattractive to to settle down in. Not, not, not to criticize my David or anybody else who lives in the city. <laughs> uh, okay. And so the other question is, how should local government adjust? Uh, service expectation among the revenue and certainty and the state um, from the state from the federal state and local sources right I, I think this is you know this is something I, I've been talking to the Cook County about a little bit uh, this is a, a it's very very difficult to know how to adjust service services, I would say that uh, compared to a normal uh, kind of budgetary climate, I would want to give the executive more flexibility about uh, service cuts um, to, to make decisions. Um, so the, the, the city manager or the mayor in a, in a municipal context um, you know, which services you cut, it's a, it's a really difficult question. I mean, uh, one thing is, uh, you know, my own personal view is that we ought to protect the vulner most vulnerable populations. Uh, and so you ought to uh, take your limited resources and, and aim them in that direction. But I think that's very much a kind of political and personal choice about how you adjust those services. It'll be very contextual, I think. Um, but uh, given the very, very high degree of uncertainty, I think you want to, um, I think you want to have more flexibility than you normally would in a, in a political environment. Yeah, I, I agree with that entirely. And, and I think, um, you know, I hate to say it, but, you know, we have this categorization of essential services in the private sector versus non-essential. And I don't think there are that many non-essential services in government. One would hope there aren't. But there are, you know, potential ways we can we can shift things around. My my res the research fellow in our institute, um, Dr. Ari Chris, has done some work on on efficiency and, and budgeting using efficiency measures. Um, but so you could think about kind of a similar thing in terms of uh, you know, how people are impacted by potential cuts and, and how to shift things around based on that. Now, the, the, one, the one thing I'm going to say, and this, this kind of addresses another question that was posed on uh, making local economies more resilient. Um, you know, one of the things that I think we have to think about is, is how much we want to be reliant on things like sales taxes. Um, the, the, uh, the, you know, we, we have, that's kind of been the default alternative for local governments looking to diversify their revenue streams. And I'm all in favor of diversification, but if we're diversifying to the sales tax, it gives us a lot more volatility. Um, the, the other thing I would mention along those lines, and, and, I, and I'm sorry, but I have to say this. Last fall, I was going around presenting my work on uh, fiscal sustainability, um, where we looked at stress testing for, for city finances. And nobody wanted to listen <laughs> because, 
because the typical response I got is, you know, why do we have to worry about this? Why would we want to stress test our finances? Well, <laughs> the last hour should have, should have, uh, it, it validates a lot of what I've been looking at for the last several years. I think um, I would just chime in with kind of two thoughts. One is that I think um, somewhat echoing what David said, I think, you know, framing we're looking at what governments are contemplating cutting in terms of equity and racial inequality, especially because we know of the disparate impacts of COVID-19 of the disease itself on people. Um, I think that's really important. And then kind of the second thing that I think is kind of noteworthy of this is the kind of political environment that's happening right now around kind of policing and conversations um, that I've seen at least in my communities with, um, with residents kind of asking public officials to kind of look as they're grappling with these budget deficits to look at rethinking policing or defunding kind of the police. And so I think that there's this, um, there's this kind of interesting political moment and political pressure uh, that citizens are kind of exerting on governments and, and trying to shape how they deal with these deficits. Yep, and that's the question. Um, would any of the panel have any indication or forecast, forecast of how the ag related economy or rural sectors are doing during the pandemic? Well, I, I can offer a couple of perspectives. I think uh, for the most part, they were able to shelter because a lot of rural America is used to having long periods where income sources are uh, not available. In other words, you plant the crops, but the revenue only comes when you sell at the end of the year. And I think uh, the last couple of years with the ongoing uh, crisis in terms of uh, US-China trade uh, relationships, um, there has been a, an enormous amount of stress that has built up where a lot of uh, farm products uh, were not able to be sold from uh, last year and the year before. And for soybeans, uh, the shelf life is not as long as it is for uh, storage of uh, other crops like corn. And I think there was some expectation that things were gonna get better. Uh, earlier this year, we had renewed negotiations and the hope was that this would result in uh, increase in sales uh, for pork products and for, for soybeans and corn. But then again, that sort of dissipated in the last couple of months. So I think at the moment, rural America is probably not faring as well. And the prospects are uh, for the uh, recovery um, to um, not really uh, have the expected stimulus in that part of the, uh, the world that it might have in, in the metro areas. And finally, we've had you know, all manner of problems related to disruptions in the food chains and in particular, uh, with a lot of animals having to be slaughtered because of uh, disruptions in the, uh, uh, the meat processing plants. And so I think, I think there's uh, almost as much uncertainty now in rural America as there is in urban America. And uh, while Ken said, you know, uh, maybe a lot of people want to go uh, live in, the, in, in those places, but if you want to engage in rural related activities like farming, uh, this is probably not a good time to go into yeah. No, I agree. I agree. Uh, the other thing I should mention just really, just really quickly is, and again, this comes from the, the I'm going to pop up the credit card data. Um, spending and, and this is credit card data versus all other data. And this is, this is nationwide. Uh, this can also be broken out into different geographies, but uh, Grocery spending has been up consistently since the, the spending, whereas you see what, what all other has done, you know, largely negative and now come back to be, to be somewhat uh, there. So, so people are still buying food. Um, uh, now, there is somewhat of a split even there with, uh, with online uh, versus, versus but, but less so than in more of the discretionary items. So I just wanted to, to kind of, you know, say that, you know, yeah, that's what, 
that's what yeah uh, but ken the the, the the consumer is spending more in the grocery store but spending less at restaurants exactly so, exactly so the net effect um yeah. may not be positive yeah, yeah. so yeah. can that that kind of data makes me think about um back to kind of our, our conversation around, around real estate of to what extent are we to like thinking about kind of downturn in, re in real estate, to what extent is it gonna be residential real estate versus commercial real estate in increasing kind of vacancies as restaurants close, as, as businesses close? I, I wouldn't expect an increase in residential vacancies. I think, you know, the, the value as an asset that, that's gonna go down, but I, I would expect, uh, vacancy increases in non-residential sector. Um, you know, we may have more people working home in the long run, but I, I also just see I think people are not gonna go to, uh, they're not gonna go out to restaurants for a long while, I'm afraid, so. All right, I don't see any more questions. I think there was one about the unemployment compensation from Dr. Bunch. Uh -huh. David, I know you were talking about this when we first started. This. Yeah, no, I, but I have not, I, I'm sorry, I haven't, I haven't followed the figures. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's not uncommon for states to uh, need to borrow from the federal government for their unemployment systems. Uh, those those revenues are relatively segregated from other state revenues, um, and, and at times the federal government will lower the interest rates. I'm sorry, I'm not up on the details of exactly what they've done. So the, the, what happens is is the unemployment system uh, goes uh, runs short of cash. Um, typically, the state will borrow from the the federal government. And in recessionary periods, the federal government kind of uh, lowers the, the cost of that borrowing. And, and this, this brings to mind another point, and this is, this is you know, related is, and this is kind of, I, I mentioned this in a recent blog post I, I had for, for uh, our college. Um, and that's interpreting the unemployment data you have to be very careful about interpreting the unemployment data because of the new program, because of the pandemic unemployment assistance program. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, what is being cited most often is the traditional state programs, which now is, is it, it's still a significant portion, but it's about two thirds of, of the current recipients. I think it's actually coming close, closer to be half and half. Um, so the pandemic unemployment insurance are for workers who wouldn't typically qualify for unemployment. Um, now those, as I understand, that's a federally funded program. And so that's not going to affect the state unemployment system. But as you're going about in local governments, making your, you know, looking at your economics, be aware that, that, that the, the unemployment claims may not be exactly capturing the entire nature of unemployment in your area as the unemployment uh as the unemployment rate number likely doesn't anymore either because of a lot of definitional issues okay and then this is a remark uh, or a comment about building up a local food or community-based food system and along that line also uh this is a general concern that you know some businesses will not come back and especially so in rural areas, um, is there any, what are some of the ideas that are there that uh, could help community, whether it's business cessation or anything that they can do to sustain or, you know, maintain their economy, local economies? Well, let me comment a little bit on, uh, I've done some thinking about businesses not coming back. And in particular, I think, um, you know, there's a great need for, city managers and for city economic development directors to think strategically about what kind of economic development policy they're gonna have coming out of the, the epidemic. And, and I think one, one possibility is to think about um, 
somewhat of a triage strategy, to be quite honest, is you don't want to be using resources to, to benefit businesses that you cannot save. Um, and then the other thing is to think about how can you restructure your, uh, your commercial districts uh, to be more attractive and more vibrant given that you're probably going to have to do some restructuring. I don't think we have really good guidance or, or research about that yet. I think uh, that's, a, that's a something that really should be put on the agenda of uh, people in these fields to think about and for professional organizations to think about. And I know, know some of them are, some of the big economic development agencies are thinking about those, but um, we'll have to be uh, working in that direction, I think. Okay. I, I just a couple of comments here. Uh, I was on a panel earlier this week uh, looking at um, food systems and disruptions in food chains. And I, I think there's a, a sort of great deal of naivety in thinking that uh, we can make this rapid transformation. And, and what has happened is American consumers um, are very addicted to variety and, and cheap prices. And to, to talk about local food systems as coming in and sort of replacing that, I think is going to be very, very difficult because the, the economics of the, of, the, uh, of the process is just not competitive. Uh, so it, it will take, I think, a very, very different picture. And, and secondly, I, I think that uh, the, there are uh, other aspects of local economic development that this is just one part of it. And I think to, to sort of amplify what, what David is, is uh, remarking here, I think there is a, a tendency among development agencies to focus on the silver bullet. And the one thing that's really gonna make a difference without thinking that perhaps some sort of diversified approach where a number of things are addressed at the same time and not putting all of one sort of economic development eggs in one basket. And I think this mistake has been made uh, during the last recession and I see a lot of evidence that we're going to go ahead and repeat uh, those uh, those activities again this time. Right. Yeah, I, this is Jen. I agree. I, I uh, agree. And also the point about Je what Jeff said about mobility is going to be the same thing too. You know, business attraction, the thought you're going to have companies move up and, you know, pick up and move during the middle of this, I think is, it's fanciful. Okay. Okay, there's another question in recognizing spike, uh, spike grocery, grocery purchases from panic buying. Does that give a false sense of security to local governments or will that spike help with the downturn? Similar to recent real estate transfers for those who leverage very competitive interest rate early in the pandemic. Yeah, and, and, that's, and that's a good question. I, I would say that the, the spike if you want to look at just the spike, it happened so early that I think I, I hopefully places have been dissuaded uh, uh, by it. Um, uh, I, I did, I was, you know, able to uh, break out restaurant spending and, and kind of aggregate it with groceries and, and food, food purchases as a whole are up. But remember that that's only a certain proportion of your of your spending. So if you want to look at something like uh, uh, apparel and accessories or sporting goods are one that I used to have on the slides I was giving at, at presentations. I mean, it was down almost a hundred percent during the height of the during the height of the uh, the, the fall. It's now you know bounced back a little bit, but. You know, there's going to be a lot of pain, and 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 kind of talking about that. Um, you know, one of the areas that both David and I have done research on is tax increment financing. So I'm thinking about tax increment financing districts where there's they're largely based on retail, which is number one, it's never a good idea anyway. <laughs> I can tell you, having researched it for several years, it's it's never a good idea. Um, but especially now I'm thinking about, for example, Shields in the, so the south part of Springfield, that, that district is very retail oriented. And so, you know, I, I think there's open questions about, you know, how the going is going to be for, for places like that.
All right. Um, so I don't see any other questions here. Um, well, if any, you have any final uh, thought, we have a few minutes here that you want to share. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, well, actually, can I just say one thing? I, I did mention, I, I think there are some green shoots in the data. Um, the, the real question is, are we going to be able to get through the, uh, get, get through the downturn? Um, you know, just this morning, one of the things that I, I, I track pretty heavily at the at the, the national level is uh, manufacturing capacity utilization. It's a measure of how factories are doing uh, and, and whether they're being idled or, and, and manufacturing capacity uh, utilization. Uh, they, they, uh, they, it's come back. Uh, it's, it's nowhere near where it was even in January, but it's starting to come back. So there are green shoots, but at the same time, you have all these other things happening with the virus that, that are a big concern. So I didn't want to be a total downer, um, but I, I think we have to look for the good things that, that are out there, but at the same time, be, be, uh, be cognizant of what, what the issues are. All right, great. Well, thank you very much. And thank you to our presenters and to all of you for your interest. Uh, have a great day. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay.